This week on the Sammy Gay Show, we have professional boxer James McGivern. Now, James has just we recently went to a, a record of 3 0 as a professional, but as an amateur, he achieved 14 national Irish titles, along with boxing at the Commonwealth and European Games. So, James has boxed at an extremely high level in his amateur career. Now, despite that and despite all of his achievements, one of the things that really fascinated me about this conversation was his emphasis on focus and hard work. We talked a lot about mindset and 1% and all these little things that accumulate that make up a great boxer. He also talked about the importance of just keeping himself grounded. He talked about the glitz and glam of being a professional and that if you don't put the hard work in, then that glitz and glam can go away. You're really going to enjoy this episode. You're going to take a lot away from it. So please like, share and subscribe. So let's get stuck in. Here he is, Mr. James, the natural McGivern. James, thank you very much for coming on today. I appreciate your time. No worries, mate. Not a problem. Glad to be here. Yeah, me too. So um, I just wanted to sort of start because I think this question is so foundational that sort of every question that I'm going to ask you, uh, apart, apart from this first one, so you like obviously you you've your very decorated amateur career. You know, you're now in the pro ranks, um, very driven, very motivated. So how do you think your early childhood experiences have sort of shaped you to become the person you are today? Um I had a fairly normal upbringing. Like you get a lot of fighters, especially fighters that a lot would tell you, like, oh, I came from nothing and came from the streets and blah, blah, blah. My mother and father, from I was in the way, gave me everything I could ever wanted. I was had a your average sort of upbringing in Belfast. Um, so that I think gives me the I got a pretty clear path on how things happen and how you're meant to act. And my mannerisms and stuff like that were getting me sort of from my parents. So I'm a drive, I'm a goal and stuff like that. They all come from my parents, I think. Like I was always well mannered and stuff like that, and that all comes from them. So my upbringing. It was, there's no like story behind it, do you know what I mean? Like, there's no highlight reel that I can go, like, I had to feed my family by fighting them, blah, blah, blah. I didn't. I'm not yeah. gonna lie, I did. Um, so that I think shapes the person I am and the way I am and how dedicated I am. My father had us involved in sport from as far back as I can remember, like, whether mm -hmm. it was Gaelic or whether it was soccer or hurling or whatever it was, we were involved in sports from no age and always stayed to be the best at everything we were doing. Yeah, so yeah. The parents probably shaped who I am and the way I am. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you say that because obviously, like, I, I come from a very similar background. You know, there was no, there's no reason really behind my drive other than my parents worked very hard. We were the same, got yeah. a very good upbringing. And there's all, there always seems to be like a, like a story behind successful people that they had to like grind and grind and grind from, from nothing to make it. But there's also people on the flip side who have who have been given everything and still made it. So yeah, like exactly. there's there's no reason. Like, I don't think there's any reason that there has to be. If you're going to be successful, make it. There doesn't have to be a story behind it. Yeah, you don't. You don't. If you if you were born in the arm road in the market or the short term, or West Belfast or wherever it is, there's no reason you go. Jesus, I'm not poor. I can't make it. Yeah, you know what I mean. I hear people that and the, there's actually a lot of people that who probably do come from similar backgrounds to me and yourself that lie. Mm -hmm. and tell a story like oh, I'm, I'm poor and I had to do this and I had to do that and it's I've actually found it offensive like I've had this conversation with my father and I says would it annoy you if I have to say it and he said no but I would think it would annoy because it's not true yeah it's funny but it, you, you know a story like ours doesn't really sell well on stage it's not very exactly. motivating it's not very but motivating you can't bring cameras in you can't bring yeah. cameras in and go oh look what these people came from I came from a four bedroom house and we gave everything I ever wanted every Christmas there were sofas and stuff there for me yeah. So it's not like I can complain and say that I don't have anything. Well, it's like to say, if you've got a roof over your head and food on the table, you're better off than over half the world. Yeah. You know, so there's always a lot, a lot of people out worse than you or, or, or us for that matter. So I think everybody just tries to like, a lot, a lot of people try and sort of downplay their upbringing to, to make their story yeah. sound better. No, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to upplay my upbringing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so obviously you were, you were very sporty as a kid. You, you've, Done hurling, Gaelic, everything. So, what made you really, really focus on boxing? Um, playing soccer and Gaelic and stuff. I was always good. You know, I was always like probably the fifth or sixth name on the team sheet, maybe. Mm -hmm. But then I took the boxing, and it just so happened that I took to it like a duck to water. Mm -hmm. 
there was no like I, I, it wasn't like I was fighting every day and so I, of course I fought in the street as a kid all kids do but it wasn't like I was fighting every day and I thought right I'm going to make a career out of it I've, got, I've mucked about a bit as a kid then one day I just stumbled into the boxing club one of my mates went down and my cousin Connor he went down I stumbled down into it I snuck down I was never actually allowed to go I always wanted to go and mummy and daddy would never let me yeah so I struggled one day I was just going to sneak down and did it and Danzo a very good family friend of ours I call him Uncle Danny he ended up saying to my dad James is quite good at this yeah, but that turned out that I went. Says Ray, you'll never miss a night from here forward. I remember yeah. the conversation the first day, sitting downstairs. He said, "You'll never miss a night at home." And it all just snowballed from there. There was never like a we we're going to do this. It just snowballed, and it kept happening and kept happening. It kept getting better. And then it went from being the the fifth or sixth name of the team sheet to being number one of the team sheet. And I thought, mm-hmm. right, this is really good. yeah. Uh, do you know what? You know what that actually reminded me of. Just as you said that, it's like if you get caught smoking as a kid. And you're made to smoke every single cigarette. <laughs> Only it was the other way around. It's like you never miss the night of boxing again. And you I'm just sure, never let it. <laughs> see, for the first like five or six years, see, I never missed one night of training ever. Like, yeah. For anything. Yeah. It was crazy how it all, it all actually ended up happening. I t- tell me this do you enjoy the training? Like, do you enjoy going to the gym every single day and going through the same motions? Not every day. Nah, yeah. I'm not going to say I do enjoy training. I do. I love being down the gym and being in amongst all the crack. and Love being in the lads, and then me and my dad, and my brother, are the three stooges, like we're the ones who are always at it. And then Stuart's always there. I love being in the weights gym because it's always like relaxed and a bit of crack. When you're in the boxing gym, sometimes it's a bit more stressful because it's like peak performance. If you know what I mean, that's where you're really holding yeah. on your skills. Yeah. Um, making weight, I hate making weight. Everyone does. I don't think yeah. anyone enjoys. I despise it. Of course, there's a lot of nights where you go away really cutting the arse going tonight, and I don't really want to go, but you yeah. have to go. So, yeah. yes, um, no, I do love going to the gym. There's more nights where I'm going, I want to go, than there is that I don't want to go. Yeah, well, that's always a good sign. Yeah. Do, do you feel like there, do you feel like because of like your amateur career and et cetera, et cetera, there was a bit of extra pressure on you down at your gym for the, the really sort of perform at high levels? Probably, yeah. Um, there was never, I don't want to say there was ever expectations of me, but. I was always the one that was before we were going fighting and it was, was always expected to win. You know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like yeah. you ever told you had to win or anything like that, but you were always expected. Like everyone was always expected just to win. Every time that I say it was fighting, it was just always expected to happen. I'm yeah. lucky that I, don't, I always managed to pull it off and I always did. Yeah. But yeah, there was pressure as, as a kid, there was, I suppose. And I remember sometimes I was never even worried about actually fighting or getting hurt or anything like that. I was just worried about losing. I never wanted to lose. Yeah. I didn't get nervous about getting hurt or getting knocked out or anything like that. I was always nervous going, what if I lose here? Yeah. And you have to be a loser then because I was so used to being a winner and constantly winning. Yeah. That the games you were just getting worried about losing. Yeah. Do you know what? I actually know several guys who have avoided your weight because you were in it at times. They were like, fuck, yeah. James McGivern's out there at 60 kilos. Like, <laughs> we're going up to 64. Well, I've never, I've never done that. I've always been quite confident. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. There's, I see when you get up to the senior levels, everyone that's that is the difference between people. Like yeah. who you're gonna fight. When you were yeah. a kid, you could throw people out of the water and destroy them just because you were kids. Yeah. But when you get up, it's always 50-50 and you're always looking about who's at your weight and what's going on. I never would never move the weight, but I was always quietly confident I was always gonna win. But there was always that pressure. What if just in case? Yeah, I never thought I was ever going to lose it. every time I was like I know I'm going to win but there was always that beat. what if yeah just especially when you're competing you know when you go from maybe Ulster Antrim level to well or local level I should say yeah. anybody that's listening to this that's not from Northern Ireland um, you know if you go from local level to like national level yeah. it, it, it is it is very marginal differences especially with the, the best out there yeah very very much so and like even the training you're doing like you can train as hard as you want, but you're probably nailed on guy. the guy you're going to be fighting. He's mm-hmm. training just as hard as you. So what it is, to come down to these wee small 1%. We always spoke about down in the national team, it was always called 1%. Yeah. It would be, did you sleep better? Did you maybe, were you maybe better on your nutrition? Mm-hmm. Did you go to every session? Did, did you maybe not go out with your mates one night and do something like that? I mean, it was always these wee small, small things. And that's probably as well why I'm so drilled when it comes to training camp. Yeah, like it's just as soon as training camp starts, that's it. It's just training camp. It's the same stuff every single day. Yeah, it does get repetitive. But if you don't do it, and the other guys doing it, you're snookered. 
Yeah, I always, I always remember, I was, like I was up in St. Paul's for years, a local boxing club in, in Belfast, for anybody that's listening that's not from here. Um, and I remember, you know, Brendan Irvine obviously went to the Olympics and I just yeah. remember every single day he had the same routine, the same, he was just doing the same stuff every single day. First in the gym, last to leave. And, you know, we started off and it was just, it was just strange watching him. When, when I was younger, like 19, 20, he, would, he was only a kid. And I was like, and then when I came back from Australia years later, he was still doing the same stuff. A bad stage, he was an Olympian. Yeah. So when you say 1%, like, uh, what, what would an example in a boxing gym be of, you know, getting 1% better or keeping top of those 1%? You know what a really good example is of it? You're talking about Brandy, you have to come up games together. A really good example of it, especially for me, is see when we were in our, doing our sessions, there was always a bit after you did your warm up where we did yoga stretches. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'm, see, yo, I hated it. And I mean, respect it. Because I, stretching to me, alien, I just want to go and get stuck into it. Yeah. So yeah. that there is a perfect example of 1%. It's something that sounds maybe not vital, mm-hmm. but that's the 1% that can make a massive difference. Things yeah. like that, we small things, maybe going to your physio, doing your ice baths. I hate ice baths too. Mm-hmm. Despise them. Like I'm, I'm built for the sun. I'm a guy that should be in Australia. Yeah. Not yeah. Iceland. yeah. Yeah. So doing ice baths, I they always try and take an excuse as to why I don't have to do these, but doing yeah. them is one percent. And they always used to say this is your one percent. So yeah. yeah um, well, wait, wait till you're 30, mate. Um, you'll, you'll realize how fucking important stretching is. <laughs> I'll still not be. <laughs> See, doing it, I remember saying, what am I doing this for? It's just doing nothing. And then I started, my hamstrings are so tight. Like, I can see if I was to do, like, a, your standard hamstring stretch, I'm getting to, like, the bottom of my knee Yeah. a good day. Yeah. So I hate it. But then towards the 10, the Commonwealth Games came around, I was getting down to my toes, and I was going, hang on up. It was, like, a wee sense of achievement before I even get into the ring. Yeah, yeah. And the, do then, you... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. That's the, they're just they're the one percent that I would. A lot of guys maybe talk about more important things like maybe your SNC and stuff like that, but you should be doing it anyway. That's all part of it anyway. Yeah. So the likes of scratch and then your ice baths and stuff like that are one percent. Yeah. And you obviously, you had like a, a, a said there earlier on, like you've had a, you had a huge amateur career. Um, 82 fights was it in total? Was that was it with something? It was probably, it was probably, I remember MTK asked me the other day how many it was, and I pulled like 112 out of the air. Yeah, it's hundreds. I've had hundreds of fights. I don't even know how many I've had. Yeah, so you obviously have club shows and stuff that maybe don't go on your yeah. your card too. So of all the, you know, obviously you boxed for as far as I seen, like one of your sort of early fights was in the national stadium. You know, did you box locally before you boxed nationally, or were you sort of straight into nationals? No. Um. So you start fighting when you're eleven. Is when you're first allowed to compete. Mm-hmm. My first tournament was in Tunbridge, um, in the Ulster Novices. Mm-hmm. I fought and then I fought in the Antrims which are in St. Kevin's Hall mm-hmm. up in the top of the town and then like the Ulsters I fought in the Ulsters Ulster Hall and the Ulster Seniors mm-hmm. probably I would say one of the biggest nights of my career mm-hmm. was locally a lot a lot of fights locally yeah mm-hmm. and obviously you, as, as you went on you know you said you boxed in the Commonwealth Games as well and then you obviously got chances to go all over Europe and stuff so how do you think that experience has helped you as a pro or it's going to help you in your future as a pro just being there and doing it, mate, like being there and seeing what happens and competing against the guys you were competing against. Like, see some of the guys I fought in Europe. I remember fight, I fought in the European Olympic Games. And yeah. the guy that I fought, I think he won bronze at the Olympics, sir. But he was an animal. And it was my first sort of the Commonwealth Games was my first senior tournament. But the Commonwealth Games is, it isn't the patch on what this was. The Europeans is, are so difficult. Mm-hmm. And the guy I fought there, I remember going myself, I remember the big dogs here. Mm-hmm. He hit me and he was hitting every, every punch felt like a brick was hitting me and I was hitting him and he wasn't for budging at all mm-hmm. and I went to the conferences when you're in with the big dogs mm-hmm. so being in with guys like that and fighting guys like that like that's invaluable to the guys that I'm competing with at the minute yeah yeah it's, I would like to say that boy that I fought there could probably already be in contention or fighting for belts as a pro maybe not a yeah. world champion just yet, but he could be about that level yeah uh, I know obviously you're a you're you're a boxer like by by nature you know you're hit and do not get hit style it uh, would be an absolute fucking nightmare for anybody but how, how do you like do you prefer boxing boxers or do you prefer boxing brawlers my ideal opponent is probably someone that's going to stand in the pocket with me and try and hit me because then mm-hmm. I don't actually have to move that much mm-hmm. I can stand in front of them and sort of set wee traps and 
I probably shouldn't be saying this in case someone figures it out. <laughs> but <laughs> if someone wants to stand the pack over me and try and sort of clip me or like pot chat for me, yeah, that's right up my because anyone that tries to pot chat me isn't going to help me. Yeah. And then once they start to miss, it gets happened in the first three fights that I've had as a pro. The guys come out in the first round and have this idea of having a go at you. Mm-hmm. And then you nail them a couple of times and they sort of go right. I just talk up here and make sure I don't get hurt. Yeah. But yeah, someone that wants to sort of stand and sort of sharpshoot. Yeah. They're ideal for me, so they are. Yeah. Man. Do you know what? I, I remember one of my first fights and it was it was one that I was training really hard for. And I got I, I found out the fell I was 22 at the time. And I found out the fellow was 30. And in my head, I was sitting thinking, this guy's a lot older than me. But I heard he run marathons and he was fit as a fiddle and he was a brawler. And I was like, this guy is going to be tailor-made for me. But the, he absolutely overwhelmed me the whole fight. I remember I was just yeah. trying to run. I, I didn't do as much running and sparring as I did in, in this fight. And by the end Gosh. of the round two, I felt like, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do another round here because I am fucked. But he, yeah. he just came out and absolutely over beat him in the first round. Second round was a very close one. Third round, he just completely hammered me because it was so unfit. So I always thought it would be okay for a brawler, but turns out <laughs> he, he caught up. No, I don't mind fighting boys like that. See, even if they run at you, I just turn them around, turn them around constantly. Like, don't even run because once you run, you just get momentum. So if you mm-hmm. just stay in the middle and just spin around, spin, as they come, turn around, and turn around in wee circles. And then eventually, it's like a, see the matadors, a bull. That's yeah. exactly what like stay there and wait till they come and then as they come turn them mm-hmm. and then to keep keep going around in wee small circles and then eventually just, what happens is you get mentally fatigued then yeah and the head just goes they go scrub that i can't do this no more and then they just start to lay off and you pack them yeah and i i, I keep because my missus would sit and watch the boxing with me and we would be sitting and, I, and she'd be like like there's not an awful lot happening here and i was like no you don't think there's a lot happening there's a lot oh. of like mental warfare faints and and slips and, and it might there might not be a whole lot of action the first few rounds but you know yourself it's very mentally fatiguing when you're trying to work someone out yeah i can't watch fights with my mates because they're constantly going what, what are they doing with it and i'm going lads firstly we just shut up and let me watch the thing yeah but yeah there's a whole lot of stuff going on that people don't like floyd mayweather is a perfect example i've won oh. i hate watching floyd mayweather but that man is I'm, like i always explain that you just don't know what he's doing there like it's a man's can, a master what he's doing control he controlled the control the pace of the fight he just he, just, he was so dominant without being so overwhelming. And, and the uh, yeah, he was yeah, the most dominant fighter ever. And he was a counter puncher. But he, as you say, everything was to his, everything suited him. He made everybody do what he wanted them to do. Yeah, he, when he backed up on the ropes, he, he was letting them back him up on the ropes. When he stood in the center of the ring, he wanted to stand in the center. It was, it, it was beautiful. It's beautiful to watch as a, as a boxing fan. Like, yeah. But he's not about it anymore. But I, I, did something happen in your last fight? Did the did the coach of your opponent get frustrated, or was there something said? And oh, the... uh, yes. What what, what was that about? So, I thought the guy, the last guy, I was fighting was going to be a journeyman. Yeah. But he wasn't. He, he came. To, he, I spoke to him after, and he says I was coming to win. Like I was coming to try and knock you out. And Brady didn't even realize. But I think his opponent or his coach was shouting something like, "Jab to the body," and I think he was shouting, "Throw your jab to the body and your backhand over the top." To try and get they throw the backhand, the jab is a faint, and then try and catch me with the backhand. Mm-hmm. But everything he was doing, I was just fainting him. So he was starting to just, like set up his attack, and I was fainting, and he was sort of going sh- and stopping. Mm-hmm. And he was just starting to get frustrated and frustrated. And then I think in the corner, I think they've been around four, around five in the corner, the coach was saying, Do this. And I think he told the corner, Shut up, because he was, he was going to be shut up. And I, I can't do it. I can't, he basically yeah, yeah. I can't do it. So he's just yeah. getting frustrated with the corner and telling them to shut up. And then he came out in the sixth round and sort of had a bit of a go in the sixth. So I let him punch away and was just slipping and rolling as he was punching. Just kind of, I mean, I knew I had to fight one and I was like, he's going to have, he's going to run at me here and try and have a go. Yeah. I'll let him punch the air. But I spoke to him after and he says, I came out the sixth round and had the head with Because mm-hmm. I knew I wasn't going to win. So I thought, I'll just try and cut you on my head. And I went, thanks very much, mate. That's awful nice of you. <laughs> and, like, like, at round six, there's no point in trying to cut me at round six because I'll just talk up and survey for the cut. Yeah, yeah. For the, for the next for the hour, three minutes, it's going to be. You may as well do that in round four or five or something. Yeah. So see when you have see when you have an opponent like that. Like at what stage? If you're looking at someone, like you know you're slipping, you know you're rolling, you know he's frustrated. At what point do you know I've got him here? Like what point do you know he's mentally done? He was tricky because his game plan was to let me come on to him. So he was going to almost go onto the ropes and let me draw him and hit him, and then just swing one from the fences, mm-hmm. just from the throats, just hit, swing and hope. So I knew after about the fourth round, I knew that he wasn't. I was like, I, he has nothing. He's going to beat me. But I knew I couldn't go for him and try and 
sparking or trying to stop him because I knew what his tactic was. I knew that he wanted me to do that. Mm-hmm. So I thought, in that fight, I thought, listen, I have it one. I know I have it one. There's no point in me trying to step up the pace here to try and put him away because that's where I'm going to cut. Mm-hmm. I mean, he ended up being more scrappy. You can end up getting cut. You could end up getting hurt. Yeah. I think I wobbled him in the second or third round. Yeah. And he did the, the legs wobbled. And I thought, right, I'll go from here. But as soon as I went for him, I remembered straight away that that was that's what he wanted to do. Yeah. And so, like, do you, do you feel like you're you're a, a very patient fighter? I know, was that your yeah. first six-rounder you just done recently? No, that's my third six-rounder I've done. Your, I've your done third. six rounds. You haven't done any, you didn't start off in fours and straight, straight into six. six. So th- your your third six rounder, um, like do, do you feel like you're patient over that distance? Is that and yeah. do, you, do you feel like you're ready to step up now to eight? Yeah, uh, yeah, I reckon I probably could do it now. Maybe I'll maybe maybe like do another six rounder. Yeah. But that's quite he's quite skeptical of it. He's going, Why are you doing six and eight? I was meant to do eight in that last week. Yeah, and then back back down to six, and my dad's were going, "Why are you doing it? Just take your time and relax." So I will maybe maybe stop do a couple more six rounders. Yeah, but um, no fitness wise, I felt fine that fight. It was grand. Yeah, it's a lot different. The pace is a lot different because as an amateur, it's the amateurs is a sprint. It's a three minute sprint. Yeah, three three minute sprints because you go as fast as you can. Whereas this, you're sort of relaxed a bit more. Mm-hmm. It is about trying to hurt people. I guess this sport is about trying to hurt people at the end of the day. But yeah. I'm patient. I don't get caught up with the crowd and stuff. I didn't get caught up with the crowd. Though. I'm glad I didn't because with my mates and my family and all that are shouting, you usually you can sort of find yourself wanting to impress them. And yeah, but I was sort of cool, calm, and collected, thankfully. Yeah, and it, I kind of want to talk about that now. You know, the, the the mentality. You know, as as a boxer, of course, when you're in camp, especially as a pro, you know, you're going to face, um, especially with COVID and stuff last year. You will face challenges, opponents pulling out, changes the last minute. Like, what sort of mental problems do, do you face as a professional or, or any, you know, professional or amateur boxer? And how do you keep yourself, you know, grounded and ready to overcome any challenge that's coming your way? The way I do it is I just take it as it comes. There's a great quote. I remember I have been able to be 12 years older or 11, maybe even younger. My mm-hmm. first time there in the national team. And Paddy Gallagher, the guy was called. Donegal and he says the only thing you control is the controllables control mm-hmm. the controllables mm-hmm. and I, that really resonated because then I went like I can't control dodgy judging I can't control someone getting COVID I can't control someone getting a cut and pulling out I can't control the show the whole, I haven't had the fight in June the whole show got cancelled mm-hmm. I can't control it there's, there's nothing in my part I can do about that all I can do is make sure I'm ready to go mm-hmm. whenever the first fight things so that's I just keep that in my head the whole time all I can do is make sure I'm ready yeah so if that happens, you you're you're sitting going, well, it's out of my control. I wait for the, yeah. you know, you just kind of do what you have to do. You make sure you show up prepared. I think that's yeah. okay. And def- there, there's there's times, especially in the first couple of years of business, you know, where I was sitting going, this customer's cancelled to me, or this has happened, or that's happened. That's like, well, it's it's out of my control. The only thing you can yeah. do, I can show up at the work all the time. I can show up and be prepared. You know, a lot of the guys would would sit and say, how do you stay so calm and these things happen like you're not frustrated you're losing money i'm like well what can i do about it really like you, you can't exactly that's a, see that see that what can i do about it that's and i always said and i don't mean it as like a i'm complaining or like out there but what can i do about it yeah someone gets injured or as you say someone cancels on you in the last minute what can you do there's, yeah. there's no point in getting pouting about it or bitching and moaning about it there's nothing that's going to yeah. change it so you might as well just accept it and move on yeah every ounce of energy you spend on thinking why did this happen to me? Is every ounce of energy you're spending on right? Let's what are we doing to move forward? Or are you wasting that? Wasting yeah, that energy. Absolute waste of energy. Um, but what like in terms of your goals for boxing, like what what is it that you want to achieve? I know you're very early in your pro career, but what are your what are your ambitions and what do you want to get out of boxing? I won't see any boxer you do a podcast with or interview or whatever, they're always gonna say the same thing. And I ain't gonna say it too. Mm-hmm. I want to be a world champion. Of course, mm-hmm. I do. You want to be, and I take on everything I do in life. I want to be the best at it, whatever mm-hmm. it is I'm doing. It could be a game of tiddlywinks, but I want to be the best at it. So, yeah. of course, that that's a long term goal. Short term goals, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. I want to enjoy it. I don't want there to be any stress. Like towards the end of my amateur career, there's a lot of stress and a lot of worries and stuff like that. Whereas now, I'm happy enough. Yeah. I'm in my own house. I'm in, with my own family. I'm in my own camp. Everything that happens is in with my own team. You know what I mean? Like I've, everything's close knit. Mm-hmm. Everything's close to home. It's at home. Mm-hmm. So for now, 
for the next however many fights, I just want to enjoy myself, have fun, go to the fights and have fun at them, not be worried about anything, just enjoy it. Yeah. Because eventually it's going to start to become more of a business where yeah. you have to be worried about things that maybe aren't just about boxing. And I know that's going to happen because that's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. So for now, I just want to have fun. Yeah. I think everybody starts off for their, you know, their, their any sort of career like that. You know, it starts off as a hobby. It starts off as fun. But then it does, you know, as as you, the business or your brand grows, you know, things do get more stressful. There's, with, with every growth comes new challenges. And if you're not getting new challenges or harder challenges in, then you're not growing enough. That's just the way I always yeah. see it. If you're not getting yeah. a, a set of new problems, then you're, you're not pushing yourself enough. But yeah. I, I just want to take you back there to what you said about the, the end of your amateur career and it was stressful. Why, why was that? I, I was away. I was down in Dublin, Tuesday or Friday every week. I'm a homebird. Like I'm, I like being around my own people. And I was down in Dublin every week. I wasn't making any money. It was just all the stress of going away and competing with all the, the top level and stuff together. It was just all starting to get up, pale on top and pale on top. Mm-hmm. And then eventually just imploded where it was just all the stresses just became one big explosion. Mm-hmm. And I actually stopped boxing. Really. That's me done. I stopped all the gear. Yeah. And then maybe for, I want to say maybe a year or so, I was just sitting about really doing nothing. Mm-hmm. I was maybe doing bits of work here and there, but I wasn't really doing a lot. And then I was sort of going, what am I doing here? Like, that's whenever I realized that I only had one thing I meant to be doing here. Mm-hmm. it's not that I'm only one, one thing I'm good at this is what I'm best at doing and this is yeah. where I belong and that's yeah. what I'm probably here to do so that's whenever I went to myself right I need to do something and then Danzo text and says well I'll just go pro it was never really a thought at the start and then I sort of sat there and thought about it and I went you know what bye why not let's do it yeah. so do you think that time off was good then just to sort of reignite the passion yeah definitely because I, I thought the boxing was all I thought the the actual sport was a problem, whereas mm-hmm. the sport wasn't the problem, it was just the things that were surrounding that. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. It was the traveling away all the time, the not making any money, the being away from friends and family, the stresses of competing and stuff like that. Whereas it wasn't actually the activity of being a boxer that was the problem. Mm-hmm. And then I actually found I found now that that's sort of how I help being mm-hmm. with like any problems or stuff like that. The boxing is my friend almost if that makes sense like boxing's a good like a positive whereas i was sort of had it as a negative space at that time yeah but now yeah. i have completely flipped the script whereas now i'm i'm just i'm buzzing about it the whole time like I'm constantly talking about it i constantly want to be around it yeah so it's more of a positive attitude toward it now yeah i mean like i've been i, I i've been passionate about boxing from for years and years realized very quickly i wasn't going to make it far but I still like I still love getting in. I still love training. I still love getting in and doing sparring whenever people ask me to. Like I, I do enjoy it that way. But it, it, I love talking about it. I love everything about it. But it, yeah, for for you, if if there's if there's stress around your passion, it could be it could be very difficult. Yeah. Well, this is it. This is the way I, I was starting to everything that was happening. It was starting to be associated with negativity. Yeah. And everything I was doing a bit boxing, just going, every time I was getting over the phone, Jesus Christ, not this again. And then stuff was happening one tease, not this again, whereas now it's happy. Everything's a positive reaction to it. Good, good. And whenever you took that break, were people sort of telling you, like, James, what are you doing? Like, get back in the ring, get back in the training, just get back at it, because you are, like, you are very naturally talented. Do you know what? See, my family and stuff, mother and father and the siblings, they didn't even mention it. No one, and I said that whenever I remember coming over here, I was in tears doing it, whenever I told them that it was stopping. And because I thought it was going to be such a big upset to my dad, especially. Yeah. He's my coach. And my mother, she, God rest, she put so much into me being a boxer and stuff like that. So I thought, how am I going to tell these that I can't do this anymore? Mm-hmm. And I thought it was going to be such a, and then it was literally like a, right, whatever. Mm-hmm. It was not, it's almost humbling that I agree myself. I thought, was, I thought it was going to be such a big deal and they were like, right, whatever. Yeah. Like it, it is just a minor thing. And then at that stage, everything, I was like, oh, wait, come off me. And I went, this doesn't even matter. If I'm a boxer, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, and even now, I still believe it. And, like, I always count myself just as an average Joe. I'm just an R number. Yeah. Like, if I go to the Rosie at the top of the street, I'm just an R hunter in the bar. Like, I'm just an R fella. And I'll always be that way because I always think that grounds you and reminds you where you're from and stuff like that. But whenever that happens, I remember going to myself, this isn't, it isn't the problem. It's not. Mm-hmm. That was sort of the start of me coming back to it. And I went to myself, this is actually all right. It's not a negative thing anymore. Yeah. Do you feel do you feel like boxing's where you can actually make your mark in the world? Do you feel like that's 
what's, yeah. your, what's your pot on this earth, put on the earth to do? Yeah, it's the only thing I can make a mark in the world. Do like I love soccer, I love Gaelic, I love hurling, I love I love loads of different things that aren't even involved in sport. Yeah, but boxing, I'm meant to do it. I always look at I, I you you just said but maybe I'm not safe all the stuff. There there's, has to be a reason why I'm naturally good at this. There has to be. Mm-hmm. And that's because what I'm put here to do is what I'm on earth to do. Yeah. And what do you what do you think separates the the naturally talent? Like, you know, there's many different sense floating about. There's so many people who are naturally talented at something. And then of course there's a, a work ethic as well, and there's a mentality. Um what was it Floyd Mayweather said, you know boxing is 98 percent mentality and one percent skill and one percent fitness like one percent talent one percent fitness how do you think what do you think about a statement like that right it is right i think see the natural talent started me that got me going because then i went myself i ain't good at this i ain't gonna Mm -hmm. keep doing this so that starts the engine but the engine will very 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 quickly cut out if you don't train. Like, yeah, I work my balls off. Sorry for cursing, but I work so hard. It's unbelievable. Well, like the by the way, this podcast, off. you can curse as much as you want. All right, for <laughs> the I have to swear. But I get up, and as I say, I work my balls off every single day. And yeah. at the times you'd be going, I don't want this no more. I can't be barbious. But mm-hmm. you always go, if I don't do this, then all the, see all the glitz and glam, me sitting here wearing my own brand and me walking about and people asking for photos and stuff like that. See if you don't work your plums off, all that glitz and glam goes. Yes. I'm not in it like that's in glam. I don't overly care about it that much. Yeah. Of course, I do appreciate everything that people do for me and all the all my fans and stuff like that. Of course, you appreciate all that. But that's the glitz and glam. That's the that's the flowery stuff, if you know what I mean. But if yeah. you don't work work as hard as you can, all that flowery stuff goes. No one cares about you. Yeah. No. Well, no one no one cares that you're you know when you, you actually step in the ring. Yes, the everybody supports you. But at the end of the day, it's you getting in the ring, and if you get in against a, a set, like a, a dangerous opponent. And you haven't prepared yourself, then you're the one that's going to end up suffering. Yeah, not on, not only the mental physical. loss, but it could be the physical loss as well. You know, the the the, the brain trauma or whatever might happen. So it's like yeah. preparation is key. It's exactly as you say. That's the North fear. Like when you see when you get especially more professional boxing than an amateur, because as an amateur you don't know who you're fighting. You go down, you weigh in, your name goes in a hat for another twenty names, and it bombs it's random. Mm-hmm. Where a professional Jamie Connell will come to me and go, You're fighting this guy in six weeks, and I can go and look and find who that guy is. Mm-hmm. Say someone goes to me, Right, you're going to fight Chris in six weeks, and I go on to go to Chris, and Chris is six foot tall, built like a house. And I go, Should I be I don't train there? Big six foot tall brick house, Chris is going to punch a coop to me. Yeah. So, should I go to your shop? I, I tend not to do that. I don't really look at my opponents as much because you can get trapped in a whole big thing now where you've got a game plan and Come fight night if the game plan goes wrong, you're snickered. Yeah. Whereas I actually get in and just go right with whatever happens, I control whatever happens as it happens, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, no, I, yeah. And there's the, the way in aspect of it too. Sure. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say there's uh no finish what you were saying there and I'll I'll grab you in a second. But there's regards as you said, regards to training, like it's if you don't do the the hard, hard work, the natural talent, but it doesn't matter. At at we spark. We'll just die out if you don't add fuel that far, happy fire, I'll just die out. Yeah. And just just what you were saying about the weigh-ins are, you know, in the amateur, if you are in a competition, you know, you might have three or four fights. More or less straight after your one fight, you have to weigh in for the next one. So you kind of have to stay yeah. at that weight the whole time, even if it kills yeah. you. But in the professional, you get to obviously weigh in the day before, rehydrate and eat. Yeah. Like how, how have you found Great. that as a difference? It's so nice, mate. Let's see the I remember fighting at 56, right? And I probably wasn't far off the same sort of shape and build that I am now at 56. So with Dan to make a weight, and I mean Dan. Yeah. And I remember I fought a guy, I can't remember his name. I fought a guy in the Dad, he's from Cork, because it was Anton versus Cork. I fought a guy in the Dad, and stopped him in the second round, destroyed him. And then fought the same guy the week later, mm-hmm. 56. Mm-hmm. And it was a close fight. It wasn't a close fight, I still beat him, but it was a three rounder in the last round. It was busted. It was, oh, Jesus, I had to really work to win this fight. And mm-hmm. that's never I went this year and making weight. See, when you make weight and weigh in that damn fight that day, it's yeah. so difficult. Like, yeah. I make 59 relatively easy enough. I don't think I could get any lower. Yeah. Because sure, sure does my weight cut for me. So he yeah. has me tip top, and it's pretty easy. I don't have to kill myself. Yeah. To make it. But then, see, can't see that from the day I, the minute I get off them scales. Yeah. It's constant. You see the refueling, but it's actually harder to make weight because the refueling, but you have to force feed and you have to force water in the, you have to force food in the. 
Yeah, your I stomach, think, your yeah. stomach's probably shrunk as well. So, um, like, I stayed in my message. I know that I was in a message house. We went for dinner after before the last fight there, uh, the day after the weigh-in, on the day of the weigh-in. Sorry, I remember we maybe we got we got food in the house or something. Made food in the house, and I ate it, and I went in the book here. Mm-hmm. What are you not well? And I went, no, I'm fine, and there's no sickness in me. What's this here? And I went upstairs and laying on the floor. And I went, no, no, no. And I get up, and you want to hurt, you want to hurt me vomiting. It sounded like someone was pouring a bucket of water. Yeah. Into this toilet. And I was yeah. This is this is harder, so it is. Oh, stinking. But it's nice when you get up the next day to fight. You're on tip top shape. Everything's good. You're ready to go. Like you're you're buzzing. You're flipping about the place. It's brilliant. Yeah. I just just off the back. I, I know we're talking a little bit about mentality and weight and stuff. But you know, have you seen any pitfalls that you've seen boxers fall into? You know, mentally or physically in the pro game, uh, and you know, maybe something you're looking to avoid. Is there something? You know, something that um, you've seen that you want to go right. I, I definitely know not to do that. But there's a picture hanging my wall here of Ricky Hatton. And yeah. Ricky Hatton has always, has always been my favorite fighter. I've always loved him. Not maybe not mm. because of his boxing, just because of his personality and the way he was. Yeah. I still, the way he does it is ridiculous. Now, I, I would always stay around my weight. I wouldn't go too much further than like, I feel 59, I wouldn't go much further than 66, 67. Mm-hmm. Which people made. That's still, that's still a pretty fucking big cut. See, see, getting down from that, mate. See, once I start training properly, I'll probably jump down to about 63, 64. Yeah. And then from there, making that weight cuts pretty easy. So when I'm off season, like doing completely nothing, I wouldn't go much higher than 66. And I would keep an eye on it and make sure I don't go much higher. Yeah. See, once you start to the 70s, then you're talking about there's going to be some problems. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that's a pit hole to be when I avoid like that, to keep myself sort of always half ready. My second pro fight I had on 10 days of us. Yeah. Because I always keep myself ready. Yeah, well, that's that's the mark of a good pro. Look at look look at the opportunities that have come up for the likes of even the last year, like Tiafimo Lopez against that was it that was a short notice fight, wasn't it? Or yeah. no, was it was it a short notice fight against uh, Lomachenko? Lomachenko, yeah. And then there was obviously um, the guy that fought Pacquiao the other week. I can't say his name. <laughs> the Cuban fella. Oh, the Cuban guy. Uh, yeah. So that was a bit, that's a bit of a, that's a matter of days. You're talking there, near yeah. Because that was. Yeah, that was Errol Spence Jr. who was supposed to fight him. And I thought that him and Pacquiao would have been a terrific fight. But watching I that... I don't know why Pacquiao took that fight. I, and it's just going to show you. But I, I do know it's just, it's just testament to him. Like he isn't in this sport for anything or than just fighting. The best. He just, he just loves fighting. And I mean, he, he had a... T- fight, like, yeah, so I go ahead. Errol Spence is dangerous, dangerous man just to go by. And Pacquiao's body is in his 40s, is he? 40 or 42. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So he's, he's not an old man, but as far as sport goes, he's an old man. Like. Yeah, oh, absolutely. especially in boxing years. You know, Pacquiao yeah. was renowned for his, his his footwork, his speed, and those are probably the first things to die as in an agent boxer. Yeah. yeah. But, I think I, I, Stuart will tell you, he knows the numbers bang on, but there's a certain age where you start to hit, you hit the top of the mountain, and you're, as far as like your timing and your reactions and stuff like that, there's a certain, it's, I don't know why I was 25, I may have been 25, but you're, you're at the top of the hill and you're starting to come down slowly. I think I may have been 25. So when you're 42, you're probably sort of towards the bottom of the mountain. Yeah. Know, Unless the top of his hill went, you know, went up like this and it, it st- stayed like that for 15 years and like that started to drop. His is, more of a, his is just, it's probably just a street he's on. He's not even on a hill. He's just on a street where he's just staying the whole way. Yeah. I, I, but it, the, the reason I think he took that fight is because his last one was against Keith Thurman and he put on an absolute masterclass against Thurman. Uh, when I was he, when so he, long ago, wasn't it? His last like, two, two years ago, yeah. I mean, that's two, three years is a long time, like, yeah, especially f- at that age. Said, the years, like, it's like dog years, yeah. And it just, just uh, you know, staying ready. The the Cuban fella, he's a pro, he stayed ready because that opportunity came up and he grabbed it with both hands and he was able to. That's one from the it's it's a, it's guy like that. Mark of a good pro, yeah. You have to, it's, it's, and see it in this day and age, the way the sport is, you have to, yeah. Because if the fight is cancelled, they'll just, they'll just go right next, go on the next one here. Yeah. And do, do, you, do you feel if an opportunity like that came up for you, maybe not at this stage, but let's say in a year or two, whenever you're starting to think, are you, are you thinking about titles now or are you thinking about just getting a bit of experience under your belt before you I start? I tried. For that field fight there, I tried to get the Irish title. Right. I, I tried to get it on the line, but it ended up just falling through. I think it was, I don't know what even happened. I spoke to Jamie about it. And Jamie says, we'll look at it and see what happens. And then nothing ever came of it. Yeah, but it was something that I was going right. Time ready to go. Well, fit for the alpha for now. Yeah, and, and I have an attitude going forward. Like 
people always ask me about fights and stuff like that. Would you fight? And who would you fight? And will you fight? And see, see me as my manager and I. If he, if he phoned me now after this call and says, you're fighting Manny Pacquiao in two weeks, I'm fighting Manny Pacquiao in two weeks. Yeah. Why not? That's just the way it is. You're going to have to fight these. There's no point in padding it out. You're going to have to fight these people eventually, so you may as well just go on and do it. Yeah, but even I remember a couple of years ago, do you, do you know Anthony Yard, the light heavyweight? He was fighting last uh, week. And he got that chance against Ser- Sergei Kovalev. Now, Anthony Yard's yeah. a good fighter, heavy hitter, and he went over and fought him. And he put on a good performance up until, you know, the last couple of rounds before he got knocked out. I thought he fought really well. But he took that yeah. opportunity, really got his name out there. Um, and I think he's, I think he's had a couple, he, he lost to a guy uh, last year. Uh, I can't remember who it was, British champion or something. But he lost to him last year and he came back with a win. But like sometimes when those opportunities come up, you just have to go for them. See the thing about it as well is see if you lose a Sergey Kovalev, there's no shame. You lost, there's no shame if you lost it, and that's what I a real credit to the UFC. Like the UFC boys, they all there's one belt and they all fight for it. And if you mm-hmm. want to be world champion, you have to fight some top arbiters. So if you do lose, who cares? You lost to someone that's probably a, a, a world head contender or been a world title or used to be world champion or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to fight the best, the best. So yeah. there's no shame in losing to the, the best. Yeah. And do, who who is your favorite boxer like currently? Terence Crawford currently Canelo maybe as well. Them boys, but I like to see the boys that do it properly and have like an art to it. And you watch it and you go, Jesus! Like you watch Canelo when you watch him, you go, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. I love watching boxing. Like that. I, I, I don't get me wrong, I like watching all sorts of boxing, but watching the likes of Canelo and stuff like yeah. that. Of fair number. Like I, I love Terence Crawford. I think he's just. I mean, he first burst I on the scene. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. He, when he first burst on the scene, or I first heard of him, it was against Ricky Burns. And I was yeah. like, some, some Americans come to fight Ricky Burns and he absolutely battered him. And then he's just, he just makes everybody look so, so ordinary. He can do everything. It's like, remember I was saying to you about whenever I go into the ring and fight, I just, whatever happens, I'll deal with it when it happens. Mm-hmm. He would maybe do that. And there's nothing that anyone can do that he can't deal with. He has yeah. an answer for everything. I, I'd love to see him fight Earl Spence Jr. I was talking about fighting Josh Taylor, which would be a good fight, because Taylor's very, very good too. Yeah, Josh Taylor's a, an absolute beast. Yeah, Tyrone McKenna the other week, someone said, do you want to fight Josh Taylor? He's like, no way, he's too good for me. As you said earlier on, everybody says that their, their ambitions to be world champion. He, he's like, I just want to entertain the fans. I want to be the most Irish, entertaining Irish fighter to ever he's come off these waters. Like, I'll tell you what, he's well on his way. Even outside the ring, he's an entertainer. Like inside, of course, he goes to war and it's a battle. But even outside, like I sit and watch on Instagram, like it's a like a wee TV show or something. Because there's yeah. always something funny happening. Like he's always doing something funny. Yeah, him and Tyrone McCulloch, Jesus, the the stuff they get up to, it's just it's hilarious. And then even see Big Sean McComb, see going to come back in him. I swear to God, mate, I can come come back in for the best six pack ever just from laughing at him. <laughs> he's so funny. So he has him and Kurt Walker, a guy, a core double act as well. So they are. Yeah, I, I don't know what I, I got to know Kurt. He, he used to come down to our club to spar with, with Brandy and a couple of people from St. Paul's. I haven't seen him in quite a few years, but uh, geez, he's he's some talent as well. Unbelievable. I think he's, I think he's new destined now to go pro. I don't think he's going to stick about the amateur for too much longer. Yeah, yeah. But fantastic. See, I remember watching him in the European Games, the same ones I was talking about. Jesus, mate, he was unstoppable. Yeah. And he is. He's, he's unbelievable. He's probably the best Irish fighter to not. Yeah. As a, as an amateur. Yeah, I I just remember him, you know, as a kid. He, he this young when he what what is he now? Like twenty, probably same age you, is he? Four, twenty-five, maybe. Twenty-four. 24. He, he was only a kid coming down. He was only you know fifteen, sixteen, but Christ, he just used to dance around around people. Even our one, just naturally talented, naturally yeah. gifted. Have you ever sparred in St. Paul's? Have you ever seen the size of the ring? Like it's so small. I became like you know the me and Jordy sparred. You're Jordy's cousin. Jordy, your cousin. Jordy Ger- 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 Matthews, yeah, he's Jordy my cousin. Matthews. I yeah. made a spar with Jordy up in some falls a couple of times today. Yeah, rings a fucking nightmare. Like it's the, if you're, the box. Yeah, it's like a phone box. Uh-huh. It's great when you get into a bigger ring. <laughs> ah, you can do you can do a bit around about the place. Yeah. Um. So if you could spend one day in the gym with a former or current world champion, who would it be and why? Ricky Hatton, because Ricky Hatton, because he looks like a good crack, and he likes the same music I like, and he, mm-hmm. he seems like a similar character to me. I reckon yeah. me and Ricky would have a good time together. Yeah. Have you ever met him? Like at all? Uh, no, I haven't. A couple of my mates, Brett McGinty. Um, he is actually over Ricky's house coach. Yeah. 
um, Cameron Lloyd and Ard, one of my mates from the amateur background. I think he was over there the other day with them, training mm-hmm. with them. And the Uptons, Patty King as well. He knocks about Patty King up the road. He's, he must he knows him quite well because of the Uptons, I think. Yeah. Okay, Ricky Haddon. Interesting one. Um, right, so we're just going to finish you off. We've got a few like quick fire questions. I don't know, did you read them before you come on, or did you? I did. There's, there's a one there that I uh, still haven't got an answer for. Most of them have an answer for, I think. Okay, right. So, are you a morning or are you a night person? Night person, I'd be up at three in the morning playing Call of Duty. <laughs> uh, what compliment do people give you the most? Boxing, I'm not very talented. That's the Box. yeah, the good answer, isn't it? That's the, the that... generic. I'm trying to, I sat all day trying to think of a different answer. Yeah. Big shoulders. I get big shoulders. I get that all the time. Okay. Well, that's, that's not a bad one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is your hidden talent? Hidden talent? Nah, I like to say I'm quite good singing. Okay. Well, no. Wait, that's a statement. I'm going to ask I, you. I, I can sing. I would say I can sing. Other people maybe have a problem, but family with that, he doesn't agree. They just like me. I reckon I'm a decent enough singer. Yeah, okay. Stuart, Stuart McKeaton, if you're listening, the next time James <laughs> is in a strength and conditioning session, record a singing and tag me in it He's and we'll share it to the world. Him. I'll sing in the gym all the time. He's probably heard me sing. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'll say he'll be an R1. No, no, it is. He'll be, no, you can't sing. You can't sing. Same as our Jack in the back. <laughs> he told you you could sing. I heard that all the time. Okay, but you, you think you can't sing? I think I'm an alright singer. Well, before the world believes it, you've got to believe it. Is that Will Smith said? Yeah. Um, what is your biggest addiction? This is the one that I don't think I have an answer. I don't think I actually don't think I'm addicted. Now, the word addicted is a strong word. I don't think I'm addicted to anything. Do I think I play too much PlayStation? Probably, yeah. Okay. Like I would be, I would think to myself, uh, after I finish training, like, where am I going to do? I'll come to the PlayStation. Anytime I finish doing anything, mm-hmm. going to the PlayStation would be my probably go to thing that I would go and do. Once I'm done doing whatever I have to do, I would probably, yeah. so probably play on PlayStation. Mm-hmm. Okay, addiction. Do you know what? I've never been into computer games. Like one game of FIFA and I'm done. Two games max. I can't play FIFA anyway, but see Call of Duty and stuff like that. Yeah. I get it. And then there was a what do you call one? Um, no, God of War. They did yeah. like a, a Viking game. And I love Vikings and all things Vikings. So they made a Viking game. And I, I think I played it for about 12 hours straight. And didn't budge. Jesus, right. So I probably know what now that I hear myself talking. I maybe play but maybe, maybe you are addiction. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your favorite hobby? I'm going to say outside of boxing for this one. Outside of boxing, my favorite hobby outside of boxing, probably outside of sport or outside of boxing. Outside of boxing, probably playing soccer would be up there. One on Ken Hurling as well. Be yeah. Up there. Okay. Okay. And. Last but not least, what have you done that you're, what, that you're most proud of? Winning my first of 14 national titles is probably my biggest achievement. And I've won Europeans and I've won Commonwealth medals and stuff like that. But winning that there, because it was the first big hurdle I yeah. had to get over. It was always in the back of my head. It's such a big thing you have to do. I yeah. went on and won a bucket full of them. Yeah. But winning the first one was probably the biggest achievement for me. Yeah. I've seen people say, you know, like winning an Irish champion ship is hard enough like it's one of the hardest things to do in the irish boxing circuit if not the hardest yeah. but like now that you want like how, how do you feel when i'm 14 like when you say that does it sound surreal to me no but probably because i did it and i know like see the likes of brandy and Curtis and stuff like that they've all done it too yeah the top guys in the country have all won you could throw eyes to people because the top guys have all won them but so you get the number there's kids looking in that would go, geez, I would kill to win an Irish title. Yeah. And of course, that yeah. always humbles me as well because you go back and go, yeah, it is pretty good, but it did. Maybe yeah. I let down a wee bit because I go, oh, whatever. It is yeah. what it is. Seeing you get the number 10, and you're just like, huh, another one? Just... Ah, see, after, there you go. I think it was after I was about 16 or 17, you were winning like, you were winning like two or two a year because you won the Cadets, then you won the All-Irelands. So mm-hmm. you were winning so many a year. And after a while, like, I think I won... I went three. I don't know. I don't know why I did something stupid. My dad knew about it. I can't remember what it was, but it was something that I didn't have me done before. And I went and did it. My little read, whatever. It's just, I just feel just fighting. I just like fighting. I don't even look at it. Do you want the yeah. just want fights. I just have yeah. to win a sequence of fights in a row. Yeah. You know, at the end. That's a bit, it's still an unreal achievement. And so, what's next on the horizon for you as a pro? Hopefully, November time, maybe. I don't know. With nothing sort of set in stone just as of yet. I'm back in training camp now, just taking over again, staying ready, just 
hopefully I'll get a phone call in the next couple of days, the next couple of weeks, mm-hmm. with some fight news, and hopefully a date, and mm-hmm. then just get motor and get as many fights as I can. Push on from there. Yep. Awesome. And what, like, finally, where can anybody who's listening to this find out more about you or find out more about what you're about? On my Instagram, I'm starting my Instagram vlog. I on holiday, I was on holiday with Manchester, and my missus and I run the bit recording myself. My missus is like an influencer. She's dead, dead popular on Instagram. And I thought, right, for a crack, I'll run about here and record myself. But on my yeah. Instagram, James yeah. McGivern, or James the Natural McGivern, if you go on and find it. James the Natural McGivern. Any other social media YouTube. channels? On Facebook and Twitter, I don't use them as much. But yeah. if you go on to Twitter, James McGivern 17, I think it might be. But yeah. Instagram's me. I run about like a daft day on there. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, I'm really looking forward to seeing you fighting again, James. But um, look, thank you very much for coming on today. I appreciate your time. No problem, bro. Good man. Thank you very much. Enjoy Cheers. the rest of your evening. I will do. Thank you.